welcome to the On Stage Podcast, where we interview musicians and members of the entertainment community. Chris, thank you so much. Truly, it is an honor to be to be here today. I'm very glad to meet you. You're very welcome. I've always wanted to talk to you and meet you. I saw that one uh, that, the movie of yours, the cellar, well, trailer anyway, but the cellar door. And then I went and looked to see what other, you know, little clips you were in. I'm like, I like this bird. So I like this. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Gosh, that was, a, that was a whole other okay. lifetime ago. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in to the show. Everyone, as you see, we have Michelle Tomlinson. She's an acting coach actor or actress for these people who just want to differentiate yeah. and filmmaker. Um, she was born and raised in Northern New Mexico, heavily involved in video productions in high school, flipped to the other side of the camera, began acting classes while attending Eastern New York, Mexico university. And she earned a BFA in theater performance. Now, welcome, Thank welcome you. Michelle to the onstage podcast. So good to meet you. Can you, Go back and tell us what it was like when you were younger, growing up in northern New Mexico, being raised, and then suddenly, you know, you were hit with the acting bug. Well, there's not a lot of acting at that time, 105 years ago in northern New Mexico. Uh, but when I was six, I think I was six, I got to be a dancing tree in Snow White for the Missoula Children's Theater, uh, that you would travel around the country and bring all these adorable children's plays and what have you to different areas. And that was my big debut, was a dancing tree. But there was something cool that happened because my feet were bare on the stage. And it's, a, it's an interesting route because, uh, you know, as you know, like by the time I hit high school, I was in video production. So it took me back until college until I became really invested in theater and acting again. But to this day, my most comfortable way to be on a stage is barefoot. And I really think it's because I was a dancing tree when I was six and it just takes me to that, to that place. It's a preference. Mm -hmm. Others wear bare feet on the stage. You know, it's a preference, but if it helps you, it helps you, right? Right. Um, it's a grounding thing, I think. You got to get a foot of the rest, right? Bada, um, bump, bump. Don't put a toe out of line, my bump, friend. Bump, bump. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me what sort of genre that you like. Do you prefer action? you prefer drama? Do you prefer uh, romance? What type do you like when it comes to a script? Ironically, I'm the last person in the world who would really be drawn to any type of romantic thing. Uh, it's not really what I'm not the, I'm not the audience. I've never been the audience for romance uh, for films. Uh, but I grew up watching a lot of action and horror films. You know, my favorite Christmas film is Die Hard. You know, it's, um, so I grew up with horror and action and war films and stuff like that. And, and so I've been in, you know, horror from an acting perspective, which was a tremendous amount of fun. And then I've taken this strange, turn that if you would have said uh, five years ago, oh my gosh, if you would have said two years ago, like, hey, you're about to get involved in romantical films as a director, I would have giggled and said, nah, -uh, no, I'm not. But here we are, you know, I'm helping develop uh, a script to, uh, from the, from the page to the stage, as we would say, uh, and it's a romantic comedy. But the one I've recently directed is a, a pure romance. It's a short film called Soulmates, and it is so super romantic, and I would have never seen myself directing that in a million years until these last couple of years hit of, of just changes of life, I guess. I don't know. Well, that's interesting. So you're directing a romantic film. How do you direct a film when it, you have, depending on you have the guy and the girl or two girls or whatever, you, how do you put that emotional romantic feeling into the movie so when people watch it's a lie i can feel it right so what is your take on that it always starts with a really good script it always links back to the writer you know and jim c is somebody i've worked with several times in the past and so when he he literally sent me a text and said hey i have a short if you want to direct it and all i said was yes and then i went Two days later, I was like, you should probably send me a script because I, I don't have a clue. Like, I didn't know genre. I had no idea 
what I had agreed to. I just knew, you know, that I trusted him enough to know that it was going to be a really cool ride. And uh, he sent this short film and it, and it tasted a little bit like what dreams may come with Robin Williams in it, which ironically is my most favorite film and it's romantic ish, but uh, it had that kind of taste in it. And I got choked up reading this 11 page short film. And I was like, Oh my God, this is the feels. This is, this is that place of, of, of like, true deep connected twin flame soulmate love and and carrying that on into the next life and i was like you know obviously the the production team is going to be super key in that because it it you know affects how you shoot something with color tones and and angles and all of that stuff and we had a ton of preparation meetings preparing for all of this and then uh the casting was a huge thing it was huge, 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 because we're talking short scenes, but really poignant moments. And the actors needed to feel things down in their toes. And Jim and I both had ideas of people who could play this one character, Poppy, the uh, the woman at the, at the end of the film. And then came this insanely good audition from Sydney Cargill that was like, oh, my God, she she's like we have to have her right now. It was, it was amazing because she got those subtle nuances and Josh Horton and Ian A. Hudson, just, it was just such a powerful trio of actors to cast. And so it was really elemental to get the right cast. Um, I knew I had the right production team. I knew it, knew it, but the cast could make or break it because they could make something really romantic, really schmaltzy and awful with their delivery, right? Like if it's over the top or not enough or whatever. And uh, I really feel strongly that we lucked out with a phenomenal team in front of and behind the camera to, to capture all of this, you know? So it's not just the director is really what I'm saying. It's, it's everybody. It's everybody coming together. What do you think is more important or what do you think is more difficult to be the one acting or be the one directing? What do you think? Or even doing both you're acting and directing. Yes. You can- oh, I don't want to act mm-hmm. in something I direct unless it's like a maybe three lines, you know, and, and something that's uh, just super quick. Maybe I get shot or something, you know, something, something like that. Or um, something like, do you have the time? Right. Okay. Or can you tell me where the train station? <laughs> it's <laughs> that way. Done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Cammy would be oh, for fine. Hitchcock. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, but other than that, I mean, each of them has, you know, acting and directing both have challenges. They both have exciting aspects of them uh, to them. They both have really easy aspects to them and they're both extremely difficult, you know? So it really is just based on uh, script again and going back to it, everything always goes back to the writing. And so it's based on script and it's based on uh, the team around each project that, that comes with the ease and grace, you know, as an actor, I've been on sets where uh, the director and their producer would be screaming at each other at the top of their lungs. And, and then the director's like, oh, God, and cut and action and cut. And, and in, in between is all this screaming. And so, you know, as this empathic actor, I'd be like, you know, twitching at the end of the day because it was such a hostile work environment, you know. Uh, so as a director, I take that kind of thing very seriously. And I start each morning off with like everybody in a circle holding hands and taking three deep breaths and standing in silence for a couple of beats just to kind of get into the same page, the same vibe, the same place. So, I mean, I guess that's a big wow. difference. Is, is that what you learn at the Stellar Adler technique taught by Arthur Mendoza? Is that, that what they teach you to do is stand in line or stand holding hands with you? Or is that something that you developed no, yourself? That's- probably from yoga classes, to be totally honest. Oh, really? You know, you know, oh, okay. when you finish a yoga class, and it's at the end, obviously, when you finish a yoga class, you get this really beautiful release. And we, you know, say namaste to each other. And uh, everybody's kind of like in that vibe. Uh, I just kind of flip it and do it at the start of the day so that we all start out in that vibe. Because there are two people who can massively affect the entire energy of a, of a set. It's the number one on the call sheet and the director and other people, of course, can cause a whole lot of drama. But when you've got the director or your, or your lead actor, actress, uh, causing a lot of conflict, 
that sets the tone for everybody. So it's really important to me from a director standpoint to set the tone as uh, up here, mindful up here. Let's just, we're all here for the same thing, you know, let's just knock it out and get the, get the job done. And so that's, that's my preference. Do you have to consult with the writer of the script to find out, okay, what do you mean by this scene? What do you mean by that line? Can we change this line here? Because it kind of doesn't suit, you know, the female actress being a female or something right. like that. Like what's yeah. your thoughts on that? Uh, there was a line of action, for example, for this one scene, it was just this line of action. And uh, it says something like Abby, Abby sits next to the bed that Sean is lying in. It's, it's something like that. So I was like, hold on, if, if it's, if we're intimating that this is his moment of passing, spoiler alert, uh, this is, you know, if it's intimating this, this thing, like, let's turn this into a scene where we actually experience the depth of loss on a cellular level. And uh, anybody who has, witnessed somebody they love leaving the earth is going to relate to uh, how we shot this. And so that, that wasn't in the script. That, that was totally not in the script. The way it was shot was not at all there. And so it's, you know, you take the writer's script and you go, okay, where can I bring some of my creativity into this that can help uh, tell this story? And then you have, you know, your production team helping tell that story with the cinematographer. You know, we talked about shots a million times before we got on set. So by the time we got on set, it was just ease and grace. It was very, very smooth. And uh, there wasn't a lot of discussion on this angle, that angle, because everything had been discussed, you know. So it was a lot of ease and grace that comes from preparation. I've seen a lot of videos on... Um movies and TV shows and the actors and actresses saying that this was not part of the script. They ad-libbed it mm -hmm. and it was kept in. Mm -hmm. So I, at least I know that you would keep ad-libbing because I know that uh, if one of the actors got the part and there was something in the script and you, would you say, I like that. Let's keep it. Would the writer go, um, Michelle, no, that's not how I wrote it. Or was the writer like, here's the script, you're free to do what you want with it? Oh, no, gosh, I, I would worry if a writer said exactly that because um, they're, I mean, they're, they're the writer, you know, without them, the script does not exist. The story is not there to tell. And so very involved with the writer, but um, the actors bringing in their own creativity, uh, you know, with an extra word here or there or some kind of tag at the end or a giggle at the end, shows their creativity and their ownership of the role. And so it really takes all of those things working together in order to tell the full story and to stint that on somebody else. Um, I don't, I, not my bag. We should all, you know, be cohesive, you know, unless they like ad lib some totally out of nowhere thing that doesn't tell the story at all, then that would get cut naturally. But uh, if it helps tell the story and move the story along from the character's perspective and it works. My gosh. Yeah, absolutely. Well, okay. Besides the uh, romance short film, what if you were to write an action film, but you have everyone, but the main star, the James uh. Bond type. So number one, what are the steps? Number one, how do you find the actor? Number two, what type do they need? Is there something they have to do, have to feel how to speak, like speak really low, hello? Or <laughs> like, how do you go about, let's say the guy's name is Tom Jackson. So Tom Jackson's the action star, the CIA, right. whatever. How do you go about finding Tom? You, well, it depends on budget, right? So if you, if you have this unlimited dream budget, then you go to all of the WME and CAA and three arts and all these giant companies to, uh, fields, you know, availabilities, or if you have the person that you want to put, you know, for me, it's always going to be Bruce Willis because that's who I grew up watching. And so, uh, you know, you put your feelers out to see if Bruce Willis is available and you can try to put those offers out. But in the world of indie film, where you don't tend to usually have these giant dream budgets, right? You would be uh, putting out feelers. Like I would, I put out feelers to agents that I already had relationships with when we were starting the casting for soulmates, for example. So I always start with the people that I know 
to ask them to submit their actors. Or if I know there's an actor like, oh man, there's this one woman who would be great for this role. I think she's with so-and-so. I would reach out and, and direct request and audition. Uh, and in this age that we're in now, we ask for a lot of self-tapes. So you've got actors mm -hmm. all over the place self-taping. And then I prefer live in person, if not Zoom callbacks. And that gives you a flavor of how that human being moves and speaks through time and space. Are they going to be cool to work with on set? Can they take direction? Are they the person? Like, you know, somebody can turn in an amazing self-tape, but that doesn't always mean they're going to secure the gig because suddenly there's uh, not a chemistry with the other people or, you know, there's all these elements to play um, to, to find that right person. I think when they, they were looking for Harry Potter, I think they saw, I'm making this number up, but it's some crazy number, like 10,000 actors before, wow. you know, casting Daniel Radcliffe. And so again, it depends on budget. It depends on the availability. It depends on, there's things about these characters that there's an unspeakable thing to put into the breakdown because it's like an essence. And you could say, oh, you know, she's she's tall and she's strong. She's really smart. She's outspoken. Uh, she's, you know, got a smart aleck attitude and uh, she holsters her weapon in this way and she has a has a herd of cats or whatever. You know, we can put this whole breakdown out and that gives, you know, representation a way to go, Oh, this actor might be good for this, this, but, and they submit based on that through the breakdowns, which is all fine and good, but there's a piece in everything that's called essence that is almost impossible to define until you see it. And it's all about the essence of the character on the page, suddenly matching essence and talent in the actor. And sometimes it takes a minute to find, and sometimes it's like, boom, right there. And, it, and it's this magical experience. But casting is, um, every casting director needs some kind of hug and award because it is a tough job trying to find that exact right person. And sometimes you can't because suddenly the actor that you want suddenly says they're not available. So you find a second actor do you, or do you just yeah. say, well, you know, Tom Smith over here hasn't needs a job to feed his family. And he looks like the perfect spy. He looks like the perfect CIA man. He could, you know, do all the moves like James Bond. Right. But when he opens his mouth, he doesn't know in English. He's a different language. So how do you deal with that? Well, I mean, God, if he's that amazing, we can always use subtitles, you know. Um, so I'm always open to the Tom Smiths of the world, per your words. But it really, mm. it, everything has to match. It just has to match. And if your first choice of blah, blah, blah doesn't pan out, well, you always have, well, who's who? I, here's who I want, right, in the, in the celebrity realm. Here's who I want. Here's like your, your B and your C of going, okay, if it's not them, then them, then them. And if you have, you know, need to open auditions, then you open auditions and you, you just keep waiting. You wait. You wait. You don't jump the gun when it comes to casting because uh, everybody is so important in, in the role of making a film. And one one piece of it can really uh, jack up and offset the entire project. So you just have to really like uh, be patient would be what I would say. But I, if Tom Smith didn't speak English, but he was like amazing and perfect and all of the things, subtitle would find a way. So you're talking about if there's a budget there or something. Now, are you familiar with the whole Back to the Future scam or issue that they had? Okay. So you're familiar with Back to the Future, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Do you know what happened there? I don't okay. think I do. What so, happened? Okay, so they originally cast Eric Stoltz to play Marty McFly. And they shot like tons and tons yes. of scenes. And they said, you know what? Number one, he wasn't working. Number two, he thought he was Mr. Big Shot. And number three, they fired him. Yeah. And then they got Michael J. Fox and they they had to get his manager from Family Ties to write him out so that he could, you know, do the movie. What do you think of that? If that were to happen, if you're doing a big budget movie and you film like two months of scenes and finally the main actor either dies or decides I don't want to do it anymore. Right. Do you have to, you have to redo the scenes or is yeah. there a way that you can do it without doing that? Well, I mean, it depends on how you shoot like the, the coverage, right? If you have like clean coverage of, 
you know, Tom Smith saying his dialogue this way, then you, there's some of it is salvageable, right? But uh, if you're going to do it, do it right. It, it, it really is that. It, it's And that that's like the difficult thing is we want to tell the story properly with integrity, with all of the everything attached to it. So if you're going to do it, you can't really uh, do it halfway. And so if somebody's not working or passes or whatever the case is, I <laughs> buy a con Dios and, you know, you, you book somebody else and you salvage whatever footage you can would be my thought, just depending on how it was shot in the first place. Well, I'm glad you said that. So if you watch Back to the Future 1 again, you'll notice that some scenes with Marty McFly, you see in the back of them, that's Eric Stoltz. There's, they still kept some of the scenes in there. Yeah, because footage, you know, if it works, you know, keep it because it, it then it makes your reshoots a little less of a you know <laughs> intense hair pulling out experience. You know, <laughs> God, I couldn't imagine that would be so frustrated. So, what do you think is the most amount of people who go and audition for a part? Is there like limits? So oh, we got fifty actors here. That's it. You can't have the 51st and it's well, number 51. That might be the one that's the one that's chosen. Oh God. Isn't that such a great question? You know, sometimes if you know, I used to work as a casting assistant in the commercial world uh, for commercials uh, about 133 years ago uh, for a woman named Melissa Martin and uh, my friend Carolyn Barry, and they were like really good commercial casting directors. And so we would have to plan out the day of like, okay, the commercials are pretty short auditions. So it's like one person or a group of people every five minutes, every five minutes, every five minutes. And so there would literally be um, a, you could only see a certain amount of time given those slots in the world of self tapes, it becomes a lot more broad and a lot more actors can be seen. So it depends on what they're looking for. If it's a co-star television role, there may only be, which is like a couple of lines for TV. Here's your coffee. You know, the cameos we were talking about, like co-star TV roles are just a couple of lines, five and under. And so sometimes that may be, you know, five or 600 submissions for the role, but then maybe 30 to 50 people audition, right? Just based on who looks right for the part. You weren't Kaden Tokarski's acting coach, were you? I am still her acting coach. Kaden and I have been working together for because we're friends now. We communicated. We had her on the podcast. It's really nice. When I saw her on That's your awesome. Facebook page, I was like, "Oh my girl, there she is!" <laughs> no, she's wonderful. Yeah. Have she's you seen wonderful. her episode? Uh, no, I have not watched yeah. her episode yet, but I'm going to. Um, she's fantastic. Awesome. She's an amazing kid. She has such a yeah. voracious appetite for everything acting. She works incredibly hard. Her script breakdown um, is top notch. You know, she she does the work. She puts forth the work and the excitement, and that's you know why she why she books so much. You know, she's incredibly talented. So, what do you think about taking a script and tearing it apart? Try to get into it to figure out the character you think there's too much that can be done or do you think there's a way that you can just here's the script this is what you do four things boom, 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 boom. Do those. oh if it was only four things wouldn't that be nice i i think too much would be if you were to make up like a, a backstory that didn't fit your script at all like uh people get very creative sometimes with these whole backstories like uh, you know for a for some for something that it would not actually exist like growing up in I don't know, Germany or whatever. And, but you, there's nothing in the script that references that. So like there's too much in the wrong direction. But when you're breaking down a script and you're really getting to know the character, you've got to know the character as well as you know yourself. You've got to be able to relate to her and really, or him, and, and put yourself in, in her place of like, okay, this is affecting me. I'm in these circumstances. What does it smell like? What does it feel like? What does it look like in here? And then, of course, when you shoot the thing, that's always going to be different. But you've got to have it here and here for the audition. you got to let everything in. And so uh, a way to do that is when, you, when you're breaking down your material, you're writing everything out. It's a way to clear out your instrument so that your instrument just automatically starts to adopt all of this because you're having the thought, you're writing the thought, and it's on the page. So you're, you're kind of hearing it as you're saying the subtext or speaking your, 
story around the character or whatever. And so you're getting all these modalities of learning. And so your instrument just kind of automatically starts to adopt it and starts to have these memories of your character and starts to really relate to the other people in time and space uh, on a deep cellular level. And that can't really happen if you just kind of like, oh, okay, well, here it is. I'm just going to bam it out. That's like, you might book, you might, it's possible. I mean, anything is possible, but it wouldn't be the thing that kept you booking and gave you a career if you, if you chose not to do much past, like, I don't know, running lines or memorizing dialogue or whatever. So how do you suppose someone like, let's make up an actor's name. Uh, Tom Smith. Jeff Smith. <laughs> and he got, okay, we'll do Tom Smith. Well, Tom Smith's actor. He finally got the part as the the Duke of York in the movie. Mm-hmm. Now you're trying to find a Duchess and an actress who's not known and she doesn't know who Tom Smith is. And now they have to be lovers. Mm-hmm. They have to kiss and they have to do all that stuff. How do you get them to that actual part in the script that they feel comfortable with one another? I'm like, oh, I have to kiss you. Like, do they? A, a how trained do you, actor knows that? that's the job. You know what I mean? Like a a trained actor goes, okay, I know that's part of the gig. And that's why there's chemistry reads, right? Like if Tom Smith and Jane Smith, I don't know, uh, are, 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 working together in a chemistry read, that's where you start to see if it's going to work or not, you know, with like Sidney Carville and Josh, Josh Horton, they had chemistry over zoom, over zoom, dude, not even in person. Really? Yeah. So, I mean, that's the gig. That's the gig. You can't, like, try. You can't, like, it's either there or it's not. You know, much like a relationship you have in your your real life. that There's either chemistry there or there's not. I see. So you have to know. So that's part of the job. So I I got a script to get to kiss a beautiful woman. You hope. Is that really what goes through their head? I don't is that know, what they go, Is that what goes through their head? Maybe. I mean, <laughs> I've like I've had to kiss a lot of people, you know, when when I was acting more, and it's a very like there was this one time where this guy's girlfriend was on set, which was totally fine. It was more than fine, you know. I could tell that she was uncomfortable that I was going to make out with her boyfriend, but I was also uncomfortable, you know, making out with her boyfriend. Yet I had to be like hot to trot, and, rah, you know, ooh, get him, and. uh, it, it just, you just can't let it affect your performance. And, and I couldn't have been less attracted to him. He was very cool, good looking dude, totally not mm. my type as Michelle Tomlinson, but my character, he was my character's type. And there again comes the work of the actor to attach meaning to the other characters and the relationship and emotions to these other characters so that you could be acting opposite a, a, a boxing pad and be in love with the boxing pad you could be acting opposite a piece of yellow tape on the corner of the lens of the camera because the camera is so insanely close that another person can't be there physically you have to be in love with that piece of tape you know so it's it can't really matter if the person's hot or not it has to matter that you have the relationship well then they just make love to the camera then (laughs) that's right that's the gig Um, Michelle, talking about affecting performance, I want to ask you about your papillary thyroid cancer. How did that occur? And oh man, what was going through your head and through your mind? It was a mess. It was weird. Um, like years before that happened, I I had had I had uh, sustained like big loss, like uh, grief, a lot of grief, and. It put a big pause in a lot of things acting because I couldn't get through uh, like losing my dad. And then Mm -hmm. I lost like two friends back to back, like right Mm -hmm. at you. So it was a, it was a lot of grief and a lot of loss. Right. So I was kind of like crawling through that. And then uh, I started acting again and started booking jobs again. And then boom, got, uh, got diagnosed with papillary Mm -hmm. thyroid cancer, but I was really, really lucky in one sense because it was, um, What's that thing in March, the clovers or whatever? Uh, it's a holiday, St. Patrick's Day. And uh, right, March? 
I think. I don't know. Uh, anyway, so St. Patrick's Day. Well, my, the Ides of March is on my birthday, March 15th. And my dad's okay. birthday is on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. So. so somewhere between those two days, Chris, is when I was washing my mm-hmm. face and I and I looked up in the mirror and for I caught myself swallowing out of the corner of my eye and I saw like this thing move with like, you know, and I was like, oh, huh, what's that? And I went to my mom and I like felt her neck and I was like, you don't have one. And I was married at the time. And I went up to him and I was like, you don't have one. And they were looking at me like, what are you doing? And I said, hey, I got a lump. I think this is not good. I think this is can't like it was instant. Like I was like, this is cancer. Uh, we got to like, ooh, got to move fast and figure <laughs> this out. And thankfully, um, we did. And, and it changed Oh my God, it changed, uh, it changed a lot, um, within me, you know, uh, there, there's, uh, that would be its own podcast all into itself. I was already well versed that life is really short and we're all just one exhale away from not being here. I got that. That was, I'm already there. But when I had the, when I had papillary thyroid cancer, I was like, no. No, this isn't going to be the thing. This is not going to be the thing that takes me out. I'm just simply going to uh, do whatever it takes to move through this. And so I investigated all these different uh, types of healings uh, from, I mean, every religion, every belief system. And uh, there was this guy named Roy Von Tama, who is a holistic oncologist. He's also an insanely good actor. Um, but he's a holistic oncologist is his day job. And it was him that was like, you know, you got to get the surgery. Cause I was like, I'm not getting cut open. This is weird. This is scary. And I don't want it. I like, if he, if the surgeon sneezes or we're in LA, what if we have an earthquake, you know, while in the middle of cutting, you know, I was like, I was terrified. I know what you mean. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Roy was like, listen, man, there's like a billion, when it's a cancerous tumor, there's a billion cancer cells per centimeter. And I had like a a nine centimeter and a 13 centimeter and a two centimeter or something like that. These tumors in my, in my thyroid, I mean, it was, it was bad. And, uh, so it just changed everything. And I had the surgery with this magical surgeon, um, Dr. Mesrobian and Nancy Rove are the best medical team in the world. And, uh, just got through it and swallowed a microwave is what I called it. The radioactive iodine, um, which sucked because when you take radioactive iodine, it's, it's, uh, you're hot, like in a radioactive, uh, way you're hot. And so nobody, no animal, no human, nobody. We became um, superwoman. <laughs> I did. That's when I twirled around and went, Ta-ta! and, uh, so it was just interesting because then it's like after, you know, the surgery and all these things. Yeah. 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 I'm like, Oh my God. In five days of complete solitude, right? Because you can't, be around another person. And so it was a lot of really good thinking and bad thinking and all the thinking happened during that time. But overall thyroid cancer was such a short, it was such a short journey, thankfully, as compared to a lot of my friends and my dad and, and, uh, other people I've known in life, their journeys with cancers can be painfully long and they don't win in the end. And so, uh, thyroid cancer taught me a level of gratitude I never had prior to having that cancer. Yeah. That's a great attitude to have. Yeah. My dad had that too. He was diagnosed with uh, lung liver cancer in uh, October of 2001. And it, yeah, by May 29, 2002, he was gone. And then in 92, my mother was diagnosed with leukemia, and then that took her life. So I'm without both my parents. I know I don't want to say I know what it's like to have cancer. I just know what it's like to have loved ones with cancer. And I'll tell you, it was... It's awful. And yeah, yeah, you don't want to be on that side of the bed. I, I prefer to visit people and help them out and open up the Bible and read to them Bible scriptures and pray with them instead of being in the bed and go, oh, come here. I, I, I've had that happened. I just, I don't like that. I like, I wish I could just, just snap my fingers and everyone in the world were healed from whatever. And this whole world can just, you can live for two, 300 years, you know, but, but I'm a strong believer in in Christ and God. You take absolutely nothing for granted. And in this life, just 
plate, have fun, work hard, and taste every moment to its fullest. But before you even diagnose with cancer, you weren't doing that. So why would something like cancer change your mindset? Is it sort of like a big boot in the in the it is pants? Yeah, it was. A, gotta, yeah. It was a big wake up call, you know. Um, because prior to that, there was still a lot that I didn't take for granted, you know, because I, I experienced loss at a very young age. And so, uh, you know, I knew not to take a lot for granted. But the thing that I didn't key into, and this is something I'm still working on all these years later, is making sure I'm also leaving room for myself. You know what I mean? Because as as a woman in this, in this society, uh, we're all taught to... Make sure that you take care of everybody else. Make sure you take care of your, you know, this person, that person, like, ah, la, 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 la. Like, make sure that you work 900. You're going to see a little bit of a bump. I'm going to adjust. Sorry. Um, make sure that you see, you know, see to everybody else's needs before ever seeing to your own. And and make sure that you work enough hours that uh, your partner, in quotes, heavy, big quotes, uh sees you as as a viable commodity to their life you know we're taught these incredibly toxic uh ideals and i was part of that a hundred a hundred percent i did not treat myself well at all you know i i drank and i smoked and all the things and and i, I did not treat myself with the kindness that i deserve and from myself and uh therefore people in my life also did not treat me with the kindness and respect that I deserve because you take the hint from how somebody treats themselves as to how you can treat them also. And it really awoken that. That piece was so missing and it also awoken that uh, I had a very long journey in healing my spirit uh, from an emotional standpoint and a spiritual standpoint of the journey that, that came that I'm still on that I think uh, I'll probably always be on because things are always going to come up and they're going to shine a light and go, hey, there's this thing that has not been looked at. You should probably look at this now to take care of that and heal. And since thyroid cancer, I just actually have stitches in my abdomen from uh, my second uh, skin cancer cut out. You know, so there's still oh, wow. life that's in session. And I feel like these lessons you know, that have presented themselves in this way are just to remind me to keep working on my own spiritual growth and to continuously be okay putting myself in a place that I can say, like, I love myself and that I'm, I'm worth being loved. And it's okay if you don't think so, or if he doesn't think so, or if she doesn't think so, you know, that, that I think so. And that that starts to be how I treat myself versus, uh, allowing myself to not be treated in such a way. Does that make sense? That's so inspirational. <laughs> so when you're writing a script about main character has cancer or something, is it, it would be a lot more easier to, um, to do, to audition the actor who's got cancer? Because they won't <sighs> understand what it means to have cancer. You do. So how would you sh show them this is how you feel when you're diagnosed and you're dying in bed or something? How would you do that? I would, because, I, you know, as an acting coach, I work on, you know, obviously auditions with actors and, and stuff like that. Looking up, it's um, in the acting world, that would be called an affliction, right? So you would look up that affliction and go, okay, it's blah, blah, cancer. You got to understand the blah, blah, cancer, right? Mm -hmm. And you go, okay, so what does that look like? What is it like? What is that diagnosis? What's the treatment? And then researching and I'm talking all from the actor standpoint, right? So part of the job mm -hmm. of the actor is to do the research of the affliction and what are the signs and symptoms and then put in the imagination space of what, unless they've experienced it, obviously there's going to be a little piece of them involved, but what is, what would that be like? What would that be like? And so from this side, from the directing or casting side, I would look for somebody I could feel it. I would have to feel their journey. I would have to feel their work in character in order to believe it just based on the cancer because every cancer is different every body every human body and how we react to having had cancer is different um 
you know, so it's, it's no two people's take on something is going to be exactly the same. I agree with that. But would it come to the time when it's like, do we have any actors or actresses that have gone through cancer or so that we can hire them and get them to audition? Because then I don't have to spend time. You ever had that come to your mind? No, because it's the actor's job to bring that to the table, uh, not mine to know their medical history. You know what I mean? Um, If they want to share it, that's more than fine. But uh, it's none of my business to be like only cancer survivors, unless it's like a PSA, you know, that's different. But I'm talking about a film, you know, so like a PSA for like the Cancer Society of uh, of America would be uh, really, you know, a better PSA with cancer survivors actually, you know, being the spokespeople. For that but uh in a film uh acting doesn't mean you've had to experience the thing acting means we need to believe that you've experienced the thing it's a very wow. it's different you know what i mean like it's uh just because you've you've uh just because i've had cancer doesn't mean i would book the girl who had cancer for an acting job that doesn't mean that at all you know even though I'd be, uh, ah, I was pregnant. I was like five or six months pregnant. I was auditioning for, I don't even remember what. I, I really don't. Then there were like these five other women in the room with me. And I was legit pregnant. I could feel my daughter like cruising around and doing somersaults and practicing soccer kicks, you know. And um, I see these other women. And I see this woman like yank up and pull this towel, this like bundled up towel out of underneath her thing. And I was like, oh, my God, Right. You don't have to actually be pregnant to play somebody who's pregnant. And I was there, the only one pregnant, and I totally didn't book it. But I was the only chick there who had baby in oven, you know? (laughs) So just because, you you know, just because it's the truth doesn't necessarily mean it's the truth that they want to share in their story. So how do you audition for people with disabilities? Um, if somebody is in a wheelchair, well, some... I would want mm-hmm. somebody who's in the wheelchair. You know what I mean? The only way that that would be at all a, a not a thing, because I have students who are, I call extra abled, uh, who are wheelchair bound, and uh, they're amazing actors. Uh, if I needed an actor to be able to go from standing, walking, running, jumping, fight scenes and all that other stuff, get injured and wind up in a wheelchair, that's very different. But if I needed somebody who was a wheelchair wheelchair bound human being or somebody who had um, a prosthetic limb, I don't want mm-hmm. somebody who can play that. That's a completely different ball, ball of wax because now we're talking about representation of um, – of a physicality that a, a human being has gone through in a very different way. That's not cancer. You're talking about somebody who is in a wheelchair. And so when, when somebody is legitimately in a wheelchair and, and spends their life there and they're booking acting jobs, they themselves become the light for other, uh, uh, in, uh aspiring actors who may also be wheelchair bound or have some other, um, uh, physical challenge that the, the, the person in the wheelchair then inspires those folks to go, oh my God, I see somebody who is at the, oh, they actually need that wheelchair in order to get through life. If they can do it, so can I. And that, and that comes the whole, whole ball of wax of why representation is so incredibly crucial in all forms of media. That's very interesting. I've, I've actually wanted to know Let's say you're in in the laundromat, whether you be in there or a store or a Walmart or something. You're looking at this guy or this girl, and you're like, "Oh my God, that's they're going to be they'd be perfect." What do you do? You go up to, "Hi, I'm Michelle Thomas, and would you like to be?" <laughs> so don't get away from the street. <laughs> like, how would you do that? How do you get I don't them? Know, maybe <laughs> come in for an audition. Oh how man. Would you do that? I don't know. I don't know because I'm very outspoken and I don't want to scare somebody to death. Um, my daughter, I'm sorry. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Honey, this is, or, um, she doesn't know what I'm doing because she's in an online class in the other room. This is an online podcast. So I'd prefer you not get in front of the camera at this moment in time. I keep, uh, I keep her <laughs> off of social. I keep her off of social media. 
It's like you won't oh, yeah, see cool. my daughter's face on social media. So that's why I'm like, don't. That's Boop. good. That's <laughs> yeah. great. You're a good mother. Yeah. Oh, I'm trying. You're a great mother. So, yeah. So you find your Tom Smith in the la- lineup of Walmart. You go, hey, right. I'm Michelle. I don't Do you know. you want to be in a movie? And say, uh, Dude, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know. I know, uh, but they're Because I'm, I'm outspoken and I'm shy at the exact same time. Uh, I mean, mm. they would have to be like, I mean, they would have to have like a golden light on them or something for me to really, uh, oh, I don't know. Ah, I don't know if I could do it. Maybe. Maybe it would depend. If I was casting something, we looked at three thousand people, and I saw somebody at, in line at, at Trader Joe's or whatever. Then maybe I would be like, "Hey, I need you to come audition for my thing because you're perfect, and here's a script." And ba 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 ba, you know, maybe, maybe just depends. I think on where I am with the project more so than uh, somebody at the grocery. Well, this a, I guess that would be protocol. Certainly, don't you have to number one? They have to go get photos taken, like headshots. Yeah. Number two, get representation, like an agent, and then they have to get a resume of where they acted before. And if not, they won't have anything listed there. Right. So they do they to, have to go? Actors more, need to in train. order to be in a movie. You have to go into commercials. Sometimes. Yeah, no, no, that's okay. Uh, training, 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 training. In the world of social media, people think they can just grow up and be famous, uh, which is true to to a certain extent. But if you actually want skill and a career, you have to take acting classes. You have got to know what you're doing. You've got to understand what's industry standard. And that goes from headshots to resume to demo reel to how to book a job to how to be on set and, you know, uh, building care. I mean, there's so much. There's there's so much. And uh, and and so the headshots and and the resume are part of it for sure. But without actual training, uh, people's headshots, sometimes uh, I've gotten selfies submitted to me for things that I've worked on, uh, like casting wise or director wise, um, where you see that it's obviously like somebody doing this and there's a, it's like portrait mode and it's weird and it's awkward and it's, wow. you know, not a professional headshot because they don't know. That's where the training comes in. You don't know what you don't know until all of a sudden, my God, you find out, you know, um, so it's, it's all about the training before you just decide to jump in front of a camera. Um, but mm-hmm. I've been doing this for 16 yeah. years. I've had people go to series on Disney. Uh, I've got somebody right. who's okay. on a soap opera, mm-hmm. uh, people who've worked with, uh, actors like the rock. Um, one of my right. students had wow. a, his wedding was on people magazine. You know what I mean? So uh, I have, and I do, and I, wow. When I took to Instagram, uh, I really only wanted to promote current students because mm-hmm. it always feels inauthentic to be like so and so who was on the you know series regular on this Disney show for like four mm-hmm. seasons was my student. You need to be my student too. I feel like that's very um, ugh, like like schmaltzy. You know what I'm saying? Like inauthentic uh, and and a, and a way to like try to grab actor's attentions, uh, not my bag. So I, I don't go backwards in that way. Yeah, I can see just acting, coaching, acting, filmmaking. Oh, <laughs> and how do you deal with your mental health with all that coming at you? Oh my God, thank you. That's, nobody asks this. You just asked the que- the one question that I feel like everybody should ask. Uh, you know, Honestly, I go to therapy every couple weeks. I go to therapy and I clean house. I do EMDR on stuff that's still kind of, you know, in the attic a little bit that needs to be wow. have a light shined on it. Um, because I really, I am, I'm also a single mom. And so the most important thing in the world to me is to be a healthy, functioning, strong minded, as strong as possible, uh, you know, minded, spiritually, emotionally, physically human being for my daughter. That's it. Everything else comes after that. And so uh, things that I do is I I do go to therapy. We hike a lot. If I don't get at least one hike a week, I hit cranky like it's like I am. I I start to twitch like I got to be out on rocks and and sitting on earth and just um, 
that it's so important to me. <laughs> so that's, that's a thing, you know, that I, and I do a lot of yoga and I do a lot of walking on a treadmill if I can't get out to a trail, you know, because my schedule is uh, challenging. So I, um, I do my best to make sure that I'm putting all of those things in place and doing a lot to take care of my own physical health, which does affect your mental health. And I make sure that my daughter's healthy. Like, if she's good, we're good. If she's healthy and strong and, and vibrant and having fun and thriving, then I'm healthy, strong and vibrant and thriving as well. You know what I mean? Because my wow. uh, instinct as a mother is to always make sure that as the flower that she is, that she's always watered. I'm not perfect. I am totally not, but I do my best. And she's the most amazing person I could have, like ever know. Like I can't even believe I get to be her mom. So I mean that's wow, really where is, the mental health is. I yeah, know. Amazing. This I'm not. A, I'm not a very uh, bad interview it. person. <laughs> that's great. This is something I can take away from this um, about what you mentioned about mental health. But also, I have a therapy cat. I don't know if you have therapy dog or therapy thing, but I, I have, have a therapy. cat, but he's he's therapy therapeutic. <laughs> Are you sleeping and don't come in his way? Um, yeah. But that, that's why I always ask on these podcasts about the mental health, because when they start talking about this, doing this, doing that, I'm going, how do you deal with your mental health? So it's important. Yeah. It's important. To yeah. That. It's huge. It's huge. Because if that starts to crumble, the whole house falls. You know, and I, and I went through like a like a sticky divorce and all the things, and, and I had to oh. stay, you know, you just have to stay in a space. And um, I would not have been able to do that without the help of friends and family. That's for sure. You know, that's where the people that you love the most who are always there for you become, uh, an intrinsic part of your healing process. So I take it your daughter doesn't want to be an actor or anything in the entertainment field or just not oh, yet? She's talked about it. She's talked about it. And I've, you know, I've said things like, yo, like I, you don't need to be an actor for my love, you know? because I work with kids as well. And so I, I want to make sure that she always knows that uh, whatever she chooses, whether it's acting or engineering or uh, teaching or art or whatever, that I'm just going to support whatever that looks like for her. As long as I tell her to do the thing that sets your soul on fire and nothing less, whatever that looks like. Which is hide your scripts. Cause one day she's going to go, mom, mom, this character, this woman, this, this is perfect for me. What would your response be? Let's do it. Let's do it. Like, why not? That's yeah, awesome. absolutely. Oh my God. Why? You know, if it speaks to her, who am I to get in the way of that? Who am I to get in the way That's of anything? Awesome. You know, as long as it's, you know, a healthy, <laughs> good thing for her to do, you know, uh, I don't want to get in the way of, of those goals for her. That's crazy. Mm -mm. And you're talking about how your schedule is always busy and yet you found time to be on my podcast. I feel so honored. Ah, oh, the honor so is much. mine. Thank you. Oh, my thank pleasure. You. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, everyone, Michelle Tomlinson out.